have uh, Scott Ritter, we have uh, Ray McGovern, we have Diane Sir, and we have Jeff Young. And because of people's limited availability and the uh, need to get as many questions in as possible, we're just gonna go right in. Um, people's biographies are available in the Reddit post. And so we're just going to start now with um, our first question. So let's bring up the first question here. So this one is not um, specifically to anybody. So anybody can grab this one. And if other people have responses to this, please feel free to go for it. This person says, please, please, someone mentioned Assange. The absence of meaningful protections for whistleblowers like Snowden, who claims he followed the whistleblower protection law but was stonewalled. Obama's wiretaps of reporters' phones to learn their sources, overclassification by the US government, which could lead to overprosecution, absence of a federal shield law, et cetera. Maybe the methods are different, but the outcomes are as similar as is the message. The message being stay silent or suffer, not freedom of speech, whether by the press or anyone else. So I thought this would be a great way to start this off. Does anybody want to respond to that? Well, I could uh, begin. Um, this is Jeff Young, a Democrat in Kentucky. Uh, I think that the way that the U.S. government has been prosecuting and persecuting Julian Assange for the last, I don't know how many years, is an impeachable offense. It is an attack on journalism itself. Uh, and it's an attack on, you know, on freedom of speech, the First Amendment. And uh, if... Um, well, any president who does not end the prosecution of Assange should be impeached for that and probably other reasons, but for that reason alone. Okay, anybody else wanna take that one up? I'll just add, uh, Julian Assange is a, a friend of mine. I used to visit him at the Ecuadorian embassy in London. Uh, he is being used as an example uh, the fourth estate is pretty much constrained now and is populated by people who read press releases and know what they're supposed to say. But Julian found a way to create a fifth estate, a state that could take confidential information, make it immediately available to people after proper vetting. That was his sin. They want to make sure that nobody else tries to do what Julian Assange did. That's why they're saying, in effect, look, you try to do what Julian Assange did. We're going to follow you all over the world. We're going to put you in prison. We're going to hold you in many ways. And if we get a hold of you ourselves, we'll put you away for 65 years. So don't even try it. Doesn't matter if you come from Uruguay or you come from Iceland or Australia. It doesn't matter. We're going to get you, okay? The only other thing I'll say is that the UN Rapporteur for Torture has actually written a book about Julian, and people should really read it. His name is Melzer, M-E-L-Z-E-R, Niels. He happens to be fluent not only in German, French, and other languages, but also in Swedish. Now, when he started to take Julian's case seriously, he went to Sweden. And I'm not quite sure whether the Swedish authorities knew of his capability in Swedish, but he read all the police documents and he found out Julian was framed by the police in Sweden under the tender uh, mercies of liaison services. And make a long story short, those women who did have sex with Julian it was consensual. They never disputed that. All they wanted was for Julian to take an AIDS test. He had just taken one. He said, I don't need to take another one. The police took that and made it made Julian into a rapist. And so what you hear, or what you hear when you talk to any American here about Julian, say, oh, that's the guy that raped those women in Sweden. It's a, it's a classic arrow in the quiver of intelligence services. They got him that way. It's a pity what has happened to him, and I dearly hope that one way or another, judicial authorities who think correctly will prevent his extradition and lead him to freedom. 
Could I add something? Uh, I. Right, yeah, and, uh, yes. I, and, uh, okay. I agree with what's been said. Uh, this is the most egregious case that we're seeing at the moment. I do have to add, as a 33-year associate of the late Lyndon LaRouche, uh, that we experienced this firsthand. And Ramsey Clark, the former U.S. Attorney General, described LaRouche and his publications. He said, "What are you?" LaRouche was given a 15-year jail sentence on conspiracy charges. And Ramsey Clark said, these are book people. This was after a newspaper, a science magazine, a journal called War on Drugs had all been shut down by the US government, which had hundreds of thousands of subscribers. And then people associated with LaRouche were given 77 year sentences and the like. So unfortunately, the case is not unique. It's the most outrageous one of a living person at the moment. And I think that if we can secure justice in this case, that it would go a long way to removing a horrible blot on the American government. Okay, thank you. Uh, Scott, this next question is for you. And this question was asked ahead of time. This person could not be on live. And um, they say this to Scott, Excellent discussion with Alexander Mercuris, Glenn Deason, and your dogs the other day. I was waiting for and glad you brought up the point about nuclear arms control. Um, I was born at the tail end of the Cold War and have no real memory of the nuclear threat of that era. And now it seems many in my generation and younger have a cavalier, almost eager attitude toward their use. How can we as average citizens, not well versed in weapons inspections, communicate this threat and the importance of re-entering arms controls treaties like the ones we've abandoned. How can we help make this a salient political issue in our current hyper-partisan environment when being, quote, tough, tough on Russia is a talking point from both parties? Free Assange, by the way. Um, good question. Uh, at a risk of sounding uh, to be self-promoting, um, George Santayana, an American philosopher once said, those who fail to learn the lessons of history are condemned to repeat it. I'd like to believe though that history sometimes provides really, really good examples um, so that repeating it isn't a condemnation, but rather the best option available. Um, the best way to learn about the importance of arms control is to learn the history of arms control. Learn you know, what, what times were like. You, know, you, you think it's bad today? Try living in the 1980s. Try living at a time where, um, you know, yes, we, we, we were funding a proxy army to kill Soviets. Uh, yes, we were uh, uh, putting sanctions in place. We called them the evil empire back then. We almost went to nuclear war, not once, not twice, three times in the 1980s. Um, you know, the, the, the United States had 300,000 troops. You know, NATO right now is talking about coming up with 300,000. We had 300,000 in West Germany on the border, ready to go to war with another 200,000 ready to fly in. Okay, so today is nothing. We sit here and talk about how bad relations are with Russia and how, you know, oh my gosh, this, that, and the other thing. In the 1980s, we were literally on the abyss. We were ready to go over. It was gonna be game, set, match, goodbye humanity. Uh, but then something happened, the INF Treaty, the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty. I don't wanna extend, but, it, it, it might have helped if maybe somebody who had been an inspector helping create this treaty actually wrote a book about it. And I just did that. So um, again, I, I wish there was a way I could get it to you for free so people don't think that I'm somehow self-promoting, but Disarm in the Time of Perestroika is a book about the times that disarmament was it came to fruition, the importance of on-site inspection, how inspections literally pulled the world back from the brink of a nuclear catastrophe. If you read that book, you'll see how important this was. And then maybe that'll help you put into context what's going on today and why when people, I mean, I'll finish with this. This war is gonna end in, in Ukraine one day, probably sooner rather than later. Uh, and when it does end, the United States and Russia are gonna have to work together to find a diplomatic <laughs> offer. And um, this, this book, Disarm in the Time of Perestroika shows that the INF Treaty provides a template for just that. If only people would educate themselves, because if you don't learn the lessons of history, sometimes you're condemned not to repeat it. 
Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, and as always, by the way, oh, Mr. McGovern, would you like to add something on top of that? As someone who has read Scott Ritter's book, I recommend it very strongly. And I would just remind that when there were sensible people around, and I would include not only George Schultz, but Ronald Reagan, who used to listen to George Schultz, and someone on the other side, Mikhail Gorbachev, who actually suggested in 1985, let's get rid of these short and medium range ballistic missiles. We don't need them. We don't need them. We already have deterrence. I don't want to have just 10 minutes or nine minutes or eight minutes warning from these intermediate range nuclear missiles. I want to have the full 35, as dangerous as that is. Now, when I first heard of that suggestion, I said, come on, yeah. You're going to destroy a whole class of nuclear armed missiles? Give me a break. They did it. They signed the treaty in 87. They eliminated all the SS-20s in Siberia. And that's a large, large part of what this book is about that Scott has just written. And they eliminated the Pershing twos in Western Europe. Now, that can be done. And just the last thing here I'll say is that that was close to being done at the end of this past year in December. The tea leaves were clear. Uh, the Russians had frightened Biden and company. And some of them said, well, let's kind of move to reinstate the INF Treaty. And on the 30th of December, Biden promised Putin in person on the phone, the U.S. has no intention of putting offensive strike missiles in Ukraine, 30th of December. Now that fell in the cracks. That fell in the cracks. Next time they talked, it was the 12th of February. And Putin said, what about your promise? And oh, well, um, yeah. You know. So that was a big catalyst for the, this chapter of Soviet or Russian distrust of what U.S. presidents say. And it contributed largely to the calculus that, in my view, Putin used to say, well, you know, these guys are not serious. They don't take us seriously. They break their promises all the time. We're going to have to fix this in another way to make sure these medium range ballistic missiles don't go into Ukraine and come out of Poland and Romania if we can. Could I add something? Yeah, of course. OK, uh, just. Prior to that, and I would like to say that Reagan took and LaRouche made an offer to the Soviet Union on the Strategic Defense Initiative in 1981-82. The Soviet Union made the mistake, fatal mistake of rejecting that because it was an offer to develop a laser defensive system together. Uh, perhaps an echo of what Kennedy had proposed actually at the United Nations that the moon landing program be a joint program of the United States and the Soviet Union. Uh, at any rate, the plan was that working on this new technology not only would give you a means to supersede the nuclear missile technology as you developed it, it didn't exist at the time, but would also be a science driver that would allow the kind of breakthroughs in the economy that you had when we launched the Apollo program and went to the moon. The Soviets rejected this, arguing um, probably correctly that the United States would end up winning the Cold War in that case because the United States would assimilate all of the new technologies, whereas the Soviet economy would not. And LaRouche at that point made a warning. He said, if you don't collaborate with Reagan on this offer, I predict your economy is going to disintegrate. You will go bankrupt and your economy will disintegrate in five years. And in 1988, just before he was put in prison, LaRouche made another offer that in return for the reunification of Germany, the United States and the West should extend actual economic aid to Poland. And unfortunately, Germany was reunified. Uh, the to say, huh? were very generous in that. Uh, they were betrayed by the United States that NATO would not move 
one inch mm-hmm. to the end. Uh, and, and LaRouche was in prison. So a moment of opportunity when that wall came down for peaceful economic development was instead perverted and destroyed by Thatcher and Bush and a series of new wars. And we should also learn from that disaster because there was a moment of great opportunity which was squandered. Okay, perfect, thank you. And Ray, we were hearing you, I think like whisper or something there. We, we did pick up on that a little bit, but it's okay, just making you aware. Um, let me go here now. So I have a question for you, Diane, and then we have one for Scott and then another one for Jeff, and then we'll go back to you, another one for you, Scott. So Diane, this question is directed to you. And it says this, it says, for Diane Sayre, what will be your strategy once you enter the Senate to educate your Senate colleagues on the physical economy, as well as the world land bridge? And do you plan on singing with them? <laughs> well, I have said that I would uh, insist that they organize, we organized a chorus and they would have to learn how to sing so they could do something uh, beautiful together, which would be useful, perhaps change their relations. Uh, and this question of physical economy, I think we have to have a movement <clears> of people <throat> in the United States because these senators really don't have a clue. They're completely disconnected from the suffering that the American people are feeling as a result of their policies. So uh, I think this really would require a movement. It's a bigger job than one person can do but I think the singing would be an important part of it. May may I respond to that also? You may, yeah. What I would do if and when I beat the incumbent Andy Barr and and, uh, go into the U.S. House. Um, I will work uh, to change the direction of the Democratic Party. 180 degrees, especially when it comes to the issue of war and peace. Uh, I don't think there's any hope for the Republicans. I think they're too bought off by the weapons manufacturers, but uh, I will work to make it, um, to make the Democratic Party as, as much as possible a genuine opposition party. Um, I think the Democrats overestimate how much power they have. I think in, in reality, they have almost none, uh, especially since they're a Me Too party so much. So I'm going to work with as, as many Democrats as possible to cut the military budget, end all of our wars, bring our troops home, and rebuild America and make that a core part of the Democratic Party platform. All right, thank you. Okay, so moving on, uh, this one's for you, Scott. Uh, To Scott, you wrote a letter to your elected representatives after the blacklist appeared. Could you talk about that? Is it the case that the recent Ukrainian blacklisting, which had Rand Paul of the U.S. Senate, Gabbard, formerly of Congress, and two candidates, Diane and Jeff, who are running, constitute threats against serving and former elected officials, as well as interference in electoral politics by a foreign power. Well, I, absolutely. Look, I I wrote the letter because I found the uh, this blacklist to be offensive, uh, frankly speaking. It offended my sensibilities as an American. Um, it offended my sensibilities as a, as a human. Uh, the notion of silencing somebody um, is just absurd in the extreme. I, um, you know, it's funny when you when you read Citizens United and and and, and, and the debate that went back and forth on that. Um, you know, the conservatives, you know, more speech is good. More speech. There's nothing wrong with more speech. More speech. More, but not my speech. Not Diane's speech. Not Ray's speech, not Jeff's speech, just more speech. Uh, I mean, what what hocus pocus? Um, you know, but it, it, it's it's one thing to have the Ukrainian government do this. I mean, after all, they are you know a government that is uh, 
elevated such an odious character, such as Stepan Bandero, to be national hero status, and they retain the Bandera ideology in every murder, rape, and torture that they do today. It's, it's a horrible regime. The fact that we've aligned ourselves with it uh, should shock every American. It doesn't. One of the reasons why it doesn't is that um, we suppress speech. Um, you know, God forbid somebody actually write about the Bucha massacre that took place at the end of, uh, of um, March, early April, and tell the truth about it. Not truth that's manufactured, truth that comes from, for instance, say, Ukrainian sources. Imagine if the deputy mayor of Bucha said, stay in your homes because our special security forces are going to be running through the streets, cleansing them of pro-Russian collaborators. Don't be alarmed when you hear gunfire. Imagine if the Safari unit, which is an Azov battalion, neo-Nazi affiliated uh, assassination squad, uh, publishes on their website, hey, we're going to be running through town, killing Russian sympathizers. Uh, imagine if they actually published a video where someone said, hey, he's wearing white, shoot him. Um, imagine if they did all that and an outsider like me collects this data and says it, it's clear the evidence points that the murder was done by Ukrainian security services. And because I dared say that, I get banned from Twitter. 100,000 followers no longer get the benefit of my wisdom. I mean, that's probably a good thing. But nonetheless, <laughs> you know, the, the point is, you know, if you say more speech is better, then why do we silence speech, especially when it's accurate, when it's telling the truth? Um, so I find it offensive that they, they did this. I wrote a letter. I demanded that the, my, my elected representatives um, take action. I actually gave them until uh, August 21st to, uh, because that's the deadline. According to the law that they promulgated, uh, Public Law 117-128, uh, within 90 days of the law being passed, uh, Congress will receive a report from the Secretary of State or the head of the United States Agency for International Development, who will then tell Congress how this money is being spent. And I had demanded in my letter that my elected representatives confront these people about the uh, Ukrainian Center for um, Countering Disinformation, about this roundtable, about this blacklist, about the fact that U.S. taxpayer money was paying the salaries of the people who put this list together, the fact that it appears that the State Department greenlighted this list. Um, and I, and I, I wanted them to ask questions. Is this money being used for this purpose? And if so, isn't this a violation of the First Amendment, which prohibits Congress from passing laws uh, which inhibit the free, free speech? Um, I got no answer. Paul Tonka sent me a letter. It was a form letter. Obviously, um, they just simply said, send a letter that explains why it's such a good thing that I voted for this law. He didn't address anything that I said. You know, I, maybe they think I'm joking. Maybe they think I don't think this is serious. Maybe they think that there is no connection between this blacklist and the assassination of Alexander Dugan's daughter in Moscow. Maybe they don't think calling somebody an information terrorist is not only chilling, but dangerous in this day and age where political violence is rampant. Um, but I do think it's time that um, the people on this list, especially the Americans, uh, consider seeking an injunction in federal court to freeze all monies uh, that have been linked to this $40 billion appropriation, until which time the State Department can provide assurances that this money's not being used to violate the constitutional rights of American citizens through a workaround where Congress, Congress funds a foreign entity to do that what they can't do here in America. I think that might be a good course of action going down. Definitely. So, the Definitely agree. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. So uh, now we're going to go to a question for Jeff. Um, let's see here. Let me scroll right back up to it. We got a lot of questions, by the way. It's hard for me to parse through these. Um, all right. So um, let's go to this one here. Question for Jeff. Why do you focus on Ukraine so much? Aren't you an American politician? And I guess Diane can answer this too, but aren't you an American politician? Why do you not talk about the numerous domestic issues and what are you gonna to do to help resolve them? So there you go. That's well, uh, several reasons. One reason is uh, one nuclear war can ruin your whole day. <laughs> uh, the, the situation in Ukraine, I, I view as a case of American encroachment 
over a period of eight years, starting in 2014. And um, uh, we overthrew their elected government and installed a government that was not democratic in any way whatsoever. And it was, uh, yeah, it was totally controlled by the US State Department, the CIA, the Pentagon, and small groups of heavily armed Ukrainian Nazis. It was a totalitarian dungeon for the last eight years. They have been shelling civilian areas in Donetsk and Lugansk. And that is right on Russia's border. So the connection with nuclear war is, it was clear to me for, for years that at some point the Russians were going to have to do something to prevent Ukraine from becoming a huge missile infested threat to their own existence. You know, something like a seven minute missile flight time to Moscow. And uh, so that the United States is basically the aggressor in Eastern Europe since 2014. We have been pressing and pressing. And uh, finally, on February 24th, 2022, Russia's patience gave out. Um, now, we're doing the same thing in Asia, around Taiwan. And the Chinese cannot be any more clear than they have been since, uh, well, uh, 1971, um, was it? The early 70s when, when we um, recognized China as the legitimate government, uh, you know, the, the mainland, and have always said that Taiwan is a part of China. Now along come some uh, US politicians, including my opponent, Andy Barr, who want to uh, defend Taiwan. Chinese view that as a huge red line and if they get the impression that there's no way that diplomacy can integrate Taiwan back into China, they're going to uh, do something more forceful. Recently, the United States has been sending warships through the Taiwan Strait. China claims the entire Taiwan Strait as part of their territorial waters. Uh, so we're flirting with World War III. And uh, that could mean, you know, it could mean a two front war against Russia in Europe and against China in Asia. Uh, and two front wars don't go well, <laughs> especially when they are near the other countries that they're, it's near them and far from us. All right. Finally, the sanctions. This is the effect on the domestic economy, on Kentucky and every other state. Uh, the only weapon, or one of the only tools in the United States toolkit seems to be to apply sanction, more and more and more sanctions on Russia and other countries. All of those sanctions fail. It's impossible to stop a resource rich country like Russia from selling its natural resources. The more we try to do it, the more we sanction ourselves, the higher gas prices get in the United States. And inflation is something every voter is, is intensely concerned about. Uh, I have proposed ending all of our sanctions against all countries and individ individuals, because besides being stupid, and, and uh, self-defeating, de uh, they're also illegal. The UN Charter says that sanctions are an act of war and only the Security Council is allowed to apply sanctions, not just any country that feels like it. Uh, so that's the connection with Kentucky and domestic politics. Okay, um, Diane, before I give you a chance to respond to that, I want to go to Scott because I know he has to get off. Um, and I'm, I want you to, this question, um, 
I want you to also add kind of any concluding remarks you might have, anything else you might want to tell people before you get off. And of course, we'll send you any other questions that come in for you after this. But um, this person asked, what are we likely to see, in your opinion, once this so-called Zalzuni line is broken by the Russians? It's my understanding this is the last major line of fortifications that the Ukrainians have in the East. Also, if it were you in charge of the special military operation, how would you handle accomplishing the three major goals of the special military operation once that defensive line is breached? Well, I refuse to provide any advice to the Russian military without a contract and, um, you know, a, a Swiss bank account and a sufficient number of rubles being put in there. Uh, this is ridiculous. You're asking for free advice. Um, I'm joking. Um, look, What's, what's happening right now is exactly this. The, the, the Russians are, are in the process, and their allies, by the way. We, we should point out that most of the fighting that's taking place uh, today is taking place in the um, independent republics of Lugansk and Donetsk, at least independent in terms of how Russia has recognized them. Um, Ukraine, the United States, and others don't. But, um, you know, these republics believe they're independent, and they both have generated uh, militias that are fighting in their defense, and these militias are actually carrying the brunt of the uh, fighting um, that, that's going on uh, and suffering the most casualties. So it's not just the Russians, it's, uh, it's the Russians and their allies. Um, the Ukrainians had eight years to dig in and they spent every day digging in. Uh, they, they, they put that, that, that time to good use. And uh, the, the fortifications that exist are um, unlike anything we've seen since World War I. Um, the these are fortifications that look <laughs> i could take marines we could breach these fortifications in a day all right that's just the way it is but we're going to lose a lot of marines now that's okay we, we build monuments to dead marines so, you know the iwo jima memorial uh, memorializes the slaughter of five thousand marines in iwo jima i'm sure we could have put one up for tarwa um in any battle that the marine corps fought in history uh you know it, it, it it's it's what we were trained to do uh, the Russians have decided they don't want to build monuments to dead Russians, that they would prefer that they keep the uh, casualty figures as low as possible, recognizing this war and there will be casualties. As such, they've created or, uh, a methodology of, um, of, of applying the tools of the trade, so to speak, to this unique circumstance that, that exists in, in Ukraine, the, the breaching of these fortifications. Um, you know, anecdotally, you have Ukrainians uh, over and over and over again. It's not just one story. It's not two. It's 10, 20, 30, 40. It's repeated over and over again about how they went to the front lines ready to fight the Russians, wanting to fight the Russians, desperate to fight the Russians. And then they spent the next several days sitting in their trenches, getting blown up, losing 50, 60 percent of their forces, uh, finally having to be withdrawn, bloodied, defeated, without ever seeing a Russian. That's the nature of this war. Um, the vast majority of the Ukrainians who die never see a Russian. Um, and those who do see Russians tend to surrender to them rather quickly because they've been given no hope. Um, the Russians have perfected this, 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 this methodology. And right now we're looking at casualty ratios of 20 to 30 to one. That means for every one dead Russian, you're losing 20 to 30 dead Ukrainians. This is unheard of in modern warfare. Now, what happens when you breach the defenses and suddenly you come up into the wide open spaces? Um, do the Russians now throw away this uh, methodology they, that they perfected and go back to the operational mobile group uh, with you know br reinforced brigades running wild in the enemy's rear area with big arrow war? No. Why? Because big arrow war brings big casualty lists. You know, when one takes a look, for instance, at uh, the destruction of Army Group Center in uh, 1944, one of the greatest defeats of Nazi forces by the Soviets, um, they, they, they annihilated Army Group Center, drove it back, inflicted a million casualties. But they lost hundreds of thousands of dead in the process because the Germans know how, knew how to fight. Well, you know who else knows how to fight? The Ukrainians. We can mock them all we want. You know, it, it is, oh, they're getting blown up by the Russians. Yeah, so would you. So would anybody if they got thrown in that situation. But if you give the Ukrainians a chance to see you 
fix you, find you, they will finish you. Uh, they're not cowards. They are hard fighters. And the last thing the Russians want to do is bring about an equilibrium on the battlefield where the Ukrainians and the Russians are meeting as relative equals. Russia will win, but the casualties will be high. So I think what we're going to see is once the defensive lines are breached, that the Russians are going to um, play a game with the Ukrainians called, we're going to give you time to dig in. And the Ukrainians are going to go, oh, they're giving us time to dig in. We're going to dig in. And then the Russians will repeat the same process all over again. They will take over the rest of the territorial objectives with little bite-sized pieces. I don't think we're going to see big arrows because big arrows mean big casualties. Um, so that's, you know, that's, um, that's what I think is going to happen. And I think in explaining that, I just gave away the advice I would give to the Russian military. Don't do big arrows. Keep the casualties small. Magnify all your advantage. Keep the Ukrainians off balance. Um, but they don't need me to tell you them that. The Russian officer corps is one of the best trained officer corps in the world, second only to the United States Marine Corps. I'm just throwing that in as self-promoting advertisement. But um, the, 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 the point is, the Russians know what they're doing. Uh, there's a reason why they're achieving the, the successes that they are today, and that's because they're a very solid military. But again, having said that, never forget the Ukrainian military was the second largest military in Europe. It had spent eight years getting trained to NATO standards. Uh, they had good equipment, good leaders, good soldiers, um, and they're well motivated. They're defending their homeland. Um, and they will fight when given the opportunity. And uh, the Russians know this. Believe me, the Russians learned that lesson the hard way early on in this con in this conflict. So the Russians are, are going to have to be careful to ensure that they retain all of the advantages that they have in terms of fire supremacy, et cetera. And you lose that when you bring in maneuver. Maneuver is the great equalizer. Maneuver allows the enemy to use intelligence and um, you know, firepower, uh, but different kinds of firepower to dissipate the enemy's strength. And um, I think the Russians are not going to want to fight the maneuver battle. Uh, now, what are they going to do? Long story short, I think Russia has made it clear that the Ukrainian government has lost the privilege of ever governing an ethnic Russian or Russian speaker again. I mean, we again, if we close our eyes just for a second and just listen to the laws that have been passed, banning Russian language, banning Russian culture, banning everything Russian. Now, just replace the word Russian for a second and add the word Jew. And now we understand how odious the Ukrainians are and how despicable it is that the United States supports these people. Um, this is a government that hates people, that hates cultures. They view The Ukrainian nationalists view themselves as modern-day supermen, the they're, they're Aryan race. Um, they view the Poles as subhumans. They view the Russians as subhumans. And even though people say Zelensky is a Jew and the, they're with them, they view the Jews as subhumans. Um, it, it just, it's not me saying this. They say it themselves. There's video after video after video of them saying this exact thing. Um, the Russians are not going to allow these odious Ukrainian nationalists ever again to have the honor and privilege of ruling over Russian ethnic, or ethnic Russians or Russian speakers. Um, and therefore, all territory in Ukraine where there is a significant Russian population, historical connection, et cetera, will become and will forever be Russia. I think we're looking at Novaya Russia that spreads from Transnistria through Odessa, down through Kherson, Nikolaev, Dnieper, Petrovsk, up to Kharkov, and that will be forever Russia. Um, and that's that. And then if the Ukrainians want to argue that point a little bit more, then they'll lose everything else because the Russians aren't going to stop. Denazification doesn't just mean killing and imprisoning the criminals who tattoo their bodies with swastikas and take up arms to murder, rape, and torture Russians mainly Russian civilians, by the way, because they're not the bravest of people. They don't do too well when they go up against Russian Marines, Russian paratroopers, or soldiers who are ready to kill them in combat. They tend to surrender, thousands of them did, because they're not that brave. Um, but they're going to go on trial. The world's going to see the reality of the odious nature of their crime. But that's not denazification. Denazification is the elimination of the ideology, which means any political party that um, shows any 
uh, loyal to this ideology must be terminated. And termination means never allowed to exist again. And those who are members of, the, of that political party must be criminalized, which means that they have to be held accountable for their crimes. Um, this is harsh, but this is what we did to the Nazis at the end of World War II. And the threat of Bandera's ideology is every bit as real as the threat of, Nazi germ, uh, of the Nazi ideology of World War II. It means that the Constitution is going to have to be changed. And if you're going to change the Constitution, that means you have to change the government. So Zelensky is not going to be in power. Uh, the, the RADA, the parliament today, the ones that made uh, Bandera a national hero, they're not going to be in power. We're looking at an all new Ukraine. That's what denazification is. Demilitarization means anything that is affiliated with NATO will not be allowed to exist. So Russia right now is writing lots of thank you notes to the various governments in Europe, thanking them for providing Russia with billions of dollars of their finest technology. Because everything that's being shipped to Ukraine today will either be destroyed by the Russian military or captured by the Russian military. Uh, but that's the reality. There will be no Ukrainian military uh, around when this is done. They'll either be dead or captured or voluntarily disarmed and returned to their homes. That's what demilitarization means. And finally, um, neutrality. Uh, Ukraine will never be part of NATO. Uh, it will be permanently neutral. And that's just the reality of it, though. Whatever peace treaty is brought in will be dictated to the Ukrainians, just like we dictated the terms of surrender to the Japanese on the battleship Missouri and Tokyo Bay, because the defeat of the Ukrainians will be every bit as severe and without conditions as that suffered by the Japanese and the Germans in World War II. That's how I think this is going to end. Okay, Mr. Ritter, thank you so much. I don't want to get you in trouble. Whoop, you yeah. know. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, guys. <laughs> Thank you so, so much. And we will send you any questions we get more, um, and we'll put them in later. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Okay, perfect. So uh, moving on here. We have, oh, my God, we're getting, like, flooded with questions right now. Um, don't feel pressured. Um, you know, we, we probably won't get to all of them. Some of them we will answer afterwards. I'll email them to you if we don't get to finish at all. Okay, so I'm going to go to you. Uh, next, Ray, and then I'm going to go to uh, Diane, and then Jeff. And Jeff, there's an antagonistic question for you, which I'm very excited to hear. Great. For Ray, I think this one is right up your alley. <clears throat> for Ray, question about U.S. attitude towards Russia. I studied some works by a few Russian philosophers, and I see Russia as laying claim to Europe. It is rightfully theirs, and the U.S. should stay out of European affairs. If they stop sending weapons to the Ukraine and Kiev, then Ukraine will rejoin Russia followed by the rest of Europe. Do you agree we should be less antagonistic towards Russia and stay out of their affairs? Well, the question is, um, did the Soviet Union fall apart? And did the heirs to the Soviet Union say, well, fun country fell apart, but we still want to dominate the world. We still want to take over the rest of Europe. We still have our eyes on Poland and the Baltic republics after we do Ukraine. That's the question. Now, Russian specialists trained over the last two decades have been so poorly trained that they believe, they believe that Putin intends that or at least they pretend to believe that, knowing that the military industrial complex really needs a, a, a tangible enemy or else it won't flourish. So my question is simply, is this a, a case of what I call the uh, Rudy Giuliani syndrome? Now, for those who aren't tuned into uh, what Rudy Giuliani said to that fellow in Arizona, the, the head of their their legislature. Uh, he said, you've got to investigate the, the falsification of the votes in Arizona. We have, yeah, we know that. So he says, well, that's great. What's the evidence? We'll look into it. What's the evidence? And Rudy Giuliani famously said, we have lots of theories, but no evidence. Well, there are lots of theories going around there by people who, you know, if, to be charitable about it, they were very poorly trained, okay? They were trained by people like Richard Pipes. Take, for example, what's her name? Uh, Fiona Hill. Uh, 
three three months ago. She wrote an op-ed in the New York Times saying the Russians are trying to drive us out of Europe and say, don't let the door hit your backside on the way out. <laughs> her words. What's her evidence for that? The evidence that I see is that the Russians had real problems with what they considered to be their strategic nearness. In other words, uh, they had an existential problem with respect to these spaces going in, in already in Romania and Poland and eventually in Ukraine. There are lots of other reasons to think that the West was infringing upon the Russian interests in that part of the world. They warned about it very often, and they finally decided that the U.S. wasn't serious, wasn't listening to this. And then there was a new element, okay? And that element, the name is China. Now people say, well, what's China have to do with this? <laughs> Everything. There's a virtual alliance between China and Russia now, driven mostly by these idiots in our State Department. So that there, if there's a dust up, well, in either place, in the South China Sea or the Taiwan Strait, or in Ukraine where NATO becomes more, more deeply involved, the U.S. is looking at a two-front war. And as Jeff has already said, that's not really a good idea. So the problem is people don't know that Putin has no idea about uh, conquering the rest of Europe. As a matter of fact, I can prove that Putin had no idea about annexing Crimea. There was no indication, not one scintilla of evidence that that was on his mind before we mounted the coup in Kiev. Then his decision was, <laughs> do I allow our most strategic naval base and air base at Sevastopol in Crimea to fall into the hands of NATO? I don't think so. And so he had a plebiscite, people voted to rejoin Russia, and that's what happened. Now, there are lots of problems with respect to Crimea. The Russians are not going to let Crimea out of their grasp, and I can understand why they would not. So all I'm saying here is that, you know, to suspect that the Putin and the Russians are just like Brezhnev or Khrushchev or Stalin, for God's sake, and had their designs ideologically on the rest of Europe and maybe the whole world, well, forget about it. Those are people that should have been trained better. Uh, Fiona Hill is just one example. Uh, previous U.S. ambassadors are other terrible examples. So you have to really kind of consult people who know something about Russia. And when those people, like me, speak out, <laughs> well, there's a deafening silence because we kept off the airways and we kept off the print media. All right, perfect. Thank you so much. Um, by the way, you guys should just know we have 118 submissions <laughs> so far. So I'll pick the short ones. <laughs> um, and I, again, I just want to thank you all the all the speakers here for um, taking the time out to to answer these questions and and participate in the ask me anything. So, Diane, I'm coming to you now. Um, we are getting questions about your affiliation with Lyndon LaRouche, and I'll hit you with a simple one. This one might be coming off a little antagonistic. I'm not sure, but they're here. They're saying, um, where is it? I just lost it here. Oh, oh, with your leader gone, who is the natural successor? So I think they're referring to, to Lynn here. So, uh, Diane, do you want to, uh, go for that? Sure. Uh, I mean, the natural successor is LaRouche's wife, Helga Zepp LaRouche in Germany. Many people find that uh, difficult because she's not a U.S. citizen, but she was his co-thinker and collaborator for many years. But I would uh, challenge that person, uh, whoever asked, because what is what defines a leader unless a leader actually produces other leaders. And LaRouche was once asked by some younger people, what happens when you die? Who's your successor? And LaRouche said, well, either we're gonna solve this problem and not have a new dark age, in which case there will be 
no successors, or we're going to change the whole policy and I will have many successors. And I think that's a much better way to think about it as opposed to this linear, um, you know, what kind of putting things in a box. We need more leaders. We have a horrible shortage of leadership in the United States right now and around the world. I was involved in a discussion with some people who are listening now yesterday about the question of nonviolence, how Gandhi managed to liberate India from the British Empire uh, using a, a form of non nonviolent direct action. Martin Luther King picked up on this and developed it further. What was there any nonviolent way to resolve the situation that we are now seeing unfold in Ukraine? And it's very hard because when you have people who are not honest brokers and who have deeply flawed ideologies like these nationalists, um, it's not clear that you can do that. But one thing that occurred to me is if you had, for example, in Germany, uh, there were people like Bonhoeffer, there were people like the White Rose. Had there been more people in Germany who had the courage to actually defy the policy of the Nazis, perhaps there would have been a way to defeat Hitler that avoided the death of so many people. Uh, I'm sure there are people in Ukraine who are not Nazis, who are horrified by the policies of the Spanderist regime. Could they have done something that would have made a difference? I don't know. Uh, I right now feel that uh, as far as I can see, I don't know, I, I might agree with Scott Ritter that perhaps Putin had no other choice because what you were looking at if action were not taken was that Zelensky was saying that they were gonna annex Crimea and if Ukraine were part of NATO, then right there, you would have a war between NATO and Russia and who knows where that would go. I'm not sure, but this question of leadership is that, there's the principle, which is, do you love mankind? Do you love other people? Are you willing to put aside certain of your own interests to act on behalf of other people? And I think that's the question of leadership. Uh, and as I said, I mean, we have almost 8 billion people on the planet. so. We need a, not a lot more leaders, and I would challenge the person asking that question to consider perhaps they should pursue becoming a leader. All right, ah oh, man, you guys give long answers. So we're not, we're gonna after the stream, we're still gonna we're gonna have to go back and transcribe all this again too. So, um, so here's what we're gonna do, Jeff. I'm gonna go to you, and then we're gonna do one more round question for everyone else, and then because of people's schedule and time. We'll stop for today and then we can keep going possibly at a later date. We'll, we'll figure that out afterwards because there are a lot of questions that are the basis for good discussion. People are very curious and I'm sure the moderators would be happy to keep the thread open. Um, we've generated a lot of a lot of reaction. So um, well, I had uh, I had my schedule cleared for five to eight, so I can hang around as long <laughs> as you want. Well, We'll see how we go. We'll, 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 we'll come back on that uh, for a minute. Yeah. Um, so Jeff, uh, where was this antagonistic question here that I, I thought was uh, very good? Um, oh, well, this one wasn't the antagonistic one, but um, oh God, I, it got lost in the sea of the other questions. So then I'll go the, to the other one that I have for you and um, others can also take this one too. And I think Ray, you might wanna weigh in on this one too. Um, if US laws are to apply to US journalists in Ukraine, should Russian journalists be protected by Russian law while they are in the US? Um, all right, so in general, Russia and China, are law-abiding countries 
they care about obeying the law. They put a lot of effort into it. Vladimir Putin himself is a lawyer. Uh, in the United States, we have maybe five times, 10 times as many lawyers as we need, and we're not a law-abiding country at all. Our judges uh, have direct experience in Kentucky. Um, I'm sure there are some honest judges in Kentucky at the level of circuit court, uh, court of appeals, and uh, up to the Kentucky Supreme Court, but I don't know who any of them might be. I have been suing the Kentucky Democratic Party for election rigging in primaries since 2015. Um, uh, and, and Kentucky judges are simply, most of them, 100% corrupt. They throw out cases that should never have been thrown out, meritorious complaints. They have applied tens of thousands of dollars in uh, sanctions and penalties against me simply for um, filing a lawsuit, suing the wrong people, suing part of the Democratic Party establishment and in 2020, the Republican Party establishment when they rigged their primary in favor of Andy Barr, exactly the same way the Democrats do it. So the question about Russian law and US law and where it applies, uh, this is a lawless country. Our judicial branch is 99% corrupt. If there's a case that has political implications, um, I have no optimism that uh, the judgment will be fair uh, or lawful. And one example of that is the recent Supreme Court decision by six of the judges uh, to overturn Roe versus Wade. That is, uh, I read the decision, I read, I read all of the opinions by the majority, and I read the um, dissent by the three honest judges. And the, the, the majority opinions were simply uh, political power play, had nothing to do with the Constitution, nothing to do with the issue uh, of, uh, you know, the uh, protection of the health and lives of women. Uh, it was, it's the worst decision I've ever read. And I consider those six justices to be uh, corrupt, woman-hating, partisan hacks. When I get to Congress, I will introduce articles of impeachment against all six of them. And uh, we, can, we can get along fine with three good justices on the Supreme Court. Uh, the United States relationship to the rule of law is antagonistic. And I see, you know, I see the need for many impeachment of many judges. Okay, great. Uh, Ray, I don't know if you wanted to add on to that. I have a question for you next, but- okay. I'm fine. All right, question, okay, so we're gonna do one more round after this and then that, that, so we'll do this round and then the next one will be the last one. That just cause like, I, I, I don't wanna leave people hanging either. And um, by the way, Diane, somebody responded to your, your response. Um, I thought it was kind of funny. Um, they said, um, you know, it's a shame when Diane points out that you need to have basic love and decency for humanity to be a leader. So um, that's good. Anyway, uh, this is for a question for Ray and Scott, but Scott isn't here anymore. Um, in view of surveillance capability, what level of certainty is there that when there is a significant atrocity in a war zone, the NSA knows precisely what vehicles, major weapons, and groups of personnel were on site at the time it was committed? Thus, silence can be understood to mean that the NSA doesn't want us to know what they know about. 
Well, the answer is it depends. Um, it depends on operational security. Uh, if these folks uh, who Scott says actually committed those atrocities uh, were, were uh, behaving with good operational security, NSA wouldn't be able to accept their conversations. In most, most operations, there's little operational security. And so the NSA does know a hell of a lot more than they let out. Um, the NSA knows pretty much everything we do or can capture everything we do. And when NSA technical director Bill Binney told me that eight years ago, I said, come on, Bill, all our conversations, all of even come on. And he said, Ray, they can do it. They have the capability. They do do it. They don't listen to everything on your telephone but they store it away and they can easily access it if they want to get you. So uh, NSA is, is almost all powerful in that respect. Uh, on the battlefield, it depends again on operational security by the foe. All right, perfect. Thank you, Ray. So um, the next question I have is oh, for Diane. All right. Sorry, it's just uh, trying to look through the minutia here, all the um, uh, questions. Give me a second here to find it. Where was it? Uh, boy. Yeah, by the way, not all of these comments and questions are friendly. Um, not, not everybody, people are, are also calling you guys Russian bots or... Um, Putin allies, somebody's asking if you guys get paid in rubles. I think that's a funny response. I've uh, answered well, that before, no. <laughs> but it might be a stronger currency than the dollar. Okay, all right. So, uh, sorry, Diane, give me like just two. <laughs> um, gosh, there's like a great question, Steve, and I'm... Oh, I can comment. Um, anybody thinking of whether they should contribute to my campaign or Diane's or uh, Matthew Ho is another anti-imperialist uh, Green Party candidate in North Carolina for the U.S. Senate. Um, yeah, send us your dollars because they won't be worth much for long. <laughs> or rubles. No, no, no. <laughs> okay. Diane, I, I, uh, I found it here. Okay, so this one, we, we spoke about this one in the uh, in the warm up. Um, Diane, are you familiar with journalist Sam Husseini's idea called vote pack, vote pack? The biggest obstacle I've had in trying to persuade people to vote for or even consider third party candidates has been the idea that you're just throwing your vote away. Vote pack appears to be a way to break out of the duopoly on direct person to person level without risking the quote greater evil winning. Do you think this idea has potential and would you consider promoting possibly alongside other independent candidates in your race or in New York? And just to clarify what the idea is, they put a little explanation here that disenchanted Republicans and disenchanted Democrats should collaborate and both vote for third party or independent candidates that they more generally want instead of canceling out each other by voting for each of the two establishment parties. And the thinking is that this would free up votes from both of the establishment parties and this liberates the voters to vote their actual preference from among those on the ballot, rather than just to pick the least bad of the two majors because of the fear. So, uh, Diane, do you want to respond? We had that earlier. Just um, for the record, um, and for people who are listening, I actually disagree with Jeff's assessment of the Supreme Court ruling on Roe v. Wade. That's for another uh, time. On this, uh, no because a, a gimmick, which is what I think this amount, and I'm not saying that disparagingly, I understand why the person would want to do this because people always say, I have to vote for the lesser of two evils and I can't vote for you because you don't stand a chance. And I understand why the proposal is being made, but our electoral system right now is a complete disaster. It is not transparent. People don't have confidence in it. And unfortunately, I don't think we're going to solve it by trying to come up with something that sounds plausible in theory. I think we have to create, we have to go back to certain things like 
paper ballots or take uh, Bill Binney and Kirk Wiebe up on their offer to clean out the voting rolls and guarantee that elections are actually verifiable and transparent. We have to do some things that bring the voters back into the electoral process. And, and I don't think that this proposal is workable. May I add a brief thing? You may, yes, go ahead. Um, in many states, ranked choice voting has been implemented and tried out. In many cases, it's uh, worked very well, uh, whereby you, uh, you vote for your first choice. If that person doesn't make it through the first round, it has the fewest votes after one round, uh, your vote goes to your second choice. And uh, just uh, just look up ranked choice voting. I, I think it, it could help in elections where there are more than two candidates. Okay, perfect. Um, Jeff, we have one more question for you and then we have a concluding question and then we'll end there. So um, this question that came for you with the, with the American military industrial complex funding the Ukrainian war, and the Russians fighting back, should the Russians switch their strategy? Is there something they're not doing that they should be doing? How would you stop this? How would you put an end to this war? And this question is for Jeff, but I okay. think if, if others want to, um, and on this one too, go ahead. But, and then we have one more concluding question. I uh, am not uh, a veteran or a uh, expert in military strategy and tactics. So I have no advice for the Russian military. Um, I think the facts show that their campaign is succeeding uh, steadily and that the Ukrainians and NATO and the United States are being defeated decisively in Ukraine. So uh, I'm not gonna propose anything, but uh, in terms of ending the war quickly, uh, I do have a proposal, a recommendation to uh, every American politician and um, uh, general and so on. Um, pray for Ukraine to surrender to Russia. Pray for Ukraine to surrender. That will be the quickest, uh, le least bloody way to end the conflict <coughs> on, uh, in a way that will help the um, Ukrainian people the most. Surrender now, the war is lost. for everyone after this go ahead okay uh then we are now going to go to our final question which i think this one would be good to end off on um and for those asking when we'll do this again in the chat we'll figure it out um so this question um, I, this one doesn't have anyone specific so it's for all of you um, American diplomats often don't even speak the language of the country they are assigned to let alone understand the culture but also all over the world, there is an attempt to ban Russian culture, music, literature, even science. So it's not just an American problem. This is dark age stuff. How can we re reverse heading into a new dark age by reasserting cultural freedom and the right to embrace and defend the best from humanity, no matter where it comes from? Oh, I could jump in on that if that's OK. Um... Actually, I oh, want to hear okay. from Ray first, sure. and then we'll go. Yeah. Uh, who first? Ray. Ah, okay. You. Yeah. Well, you know, there's a know nothing kind of atmosphere uh, in the West with respect to Russia. It's not new, but it's uh, equally unfortunate as it has been for centuries. Um, the notion that, uh, as John McCain or even Obama would put it, that Russia is simply a, kind of a gas station posing as a country. I mean, 
What kind of image does that convey or conjure up? Well, here I have uh, somebody stop for gas. Uh, Tchaikovsky is pumping the gas, and, and he says to uh, to uh, Dostoevsky, Dostoevsky, are you finished with that oil change yet, for God's sake? And push it. What are you doing there writing stuff? You're supposed to be. I mean, come on. Give me a break. Um, this is sort of cultivated from the very top. And it's really hard for me to, well, it's not hard for me to believe that McCain is, is as ignorant as, as, he, as he is or was. Obama, well, he was not ignorant, but he was very pliable. So if they told him he should throw out 55 Russian diplomats, and he thought that that would make uh, more votes for Hillary Clinton, he'd do it. If they manufactured evidence to justify the claim that the Russians hacked into the election in 2016, he would do it. He did do it. And we're seeing that all come out in court documents now. So I think the, the, uh, I think the imperative is to try, to try to broaden the understanding of Americans that Russians don't have all horns on them and Putin is not a new Hitler, far from it. Uh, and more immediately, and I'll stop here, um, what Putin and his Russian advisors did in 2014 in annexing Crimea was justified by what he considered to be an existential threat if Russia, if, if NATO took over Crimea and its main naval base in Sevastopol, okay? Similarly, if the US kept building medium range and intermediate range ballistic missiles on Russia's periphery, as they have, they've, they've, they've prepared the sites already in Romania, they're almost complete in Poland, and what would happen in Ukraine if there was no invasion? Well, I think people need to realize that there are existential threats when you go up that way against another major power. The analogy is Cuba. Back in 1962, when Khrushchev, the head of Russia, the head of the Soviet Union, put intermediate range ballistic missiles in Cuba, what did we do? We said, that's an existential threat to us. You got to back down. Now, two things about that. One is that John Kennedy, to his credit, had some sensible advisors around him. The generals, the generals, all I wanted to invade Cuba, right? Now, when John Kennedy asked his intelligence people, and I was one of them then, when he said, uh, Hey, how about these missiles? Are, are they armed with nuclear warheads? And the answer that was given to him by CIA folks was, no, we assess that, no, we assess that there are no nuclear warheads on those missiles. Wrong. Took 30 years to find out they were armed. Kennedy didn't know that, but he proceeded in a measured fashion and they got Khrushchev through a, 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 a compromise uh, involving eliminating some U.S. missiles from Turkey to back off. Now, the problem today is that there are very few sensible advisors on the U.S. side uh, that Putin sees an existential threat in what we have done and are doing in Ukraine. Putin is not going to back off he's gonna proceed to make sure that that existential threat is removed. So the real question is, what is the US, you know, NATO is the US, what is the US gonna do? Uh, will they try to intervene in such a way that nuclear forces might become involved? My God, one would say, well, that would be crazy. Well, Biden, is being advised by the crazies, okay? By people who have the best educations, but no, don't know a damn thing about the real world. Never served in the military. You know, 
So I'm talking about Blinken. I'm talking about Sullivan and all these guys that he has working for him. So what I'm saying here is the real danger is the U.S. will not realize what it means to have an existential danger. And that unlike the Russians back in 1962, the U.S. won't back off. And then we're in trouble deep because the only solution at that point would be the possible use of small yield nuclear weapons in Europe for the first time since Hiroshima and Nagasaki in Japan. That's the danger. That's why we have to, we have to speak the truth to American citizens and others and say, look, you've been, you've been fed a line just as you were before Iraq. This is the truth. We have to push that through. And I compliment the, organiz the organizers of this, uh, this seminar uh, for giving us an opportunity to speak our truth. Thanks. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Let's go then to Jeff and then Diane. And then after that, I'll give everybody a round to give any concluding remarks. All right. Well, I uh, agree with everything Ray just said, uh, except for one thing I'm not clear about. At the very end, you said the possible use of tactical, tactical nuclear weapons in Europe. Um, I don't think Russia will ever be the first to use tactical nuclear weapons anywhere. Uh, they have a no first use policy and uh, they understand that it could set off a complete worldwide full scale exchange of nuclear weapons. So I'm wondering, uh, uh, were you talking about the United States being the first to use tactical nuclear weapons as we continue to lose in Ukraine. Well, I suppose you know it's a it's a tough calculus, but the answer is is briefly yes. Um, the Russians are not going to lose in uh, in Ukraine, mm -hmm. and to the degree the United States provides more and more weaponry of larger and greater range to hit Russia, for example. Mm -hmm. um, it could escalate to the point where the Russians would do the same with respect to NATO. And then we'd be in a fix where NATO is not up to fighting off the Russians. The only possible, uh, yeah. the only possible counter would be complete co contemplating use of nuclear weapons. Now, this by the is United not States. Of, by the United States. And you know, we have the chief of what used to be SAC, the Strategic Air Command, okay? Stratcom now, I think it's called. Uh, he says, he says, yeah, we, we, we don't want to rule out the use of nuclear weapons. Right. The, the, the Navy guys out in the Pacific say the same thing. So you're Putin or you're Xi Jinping. And you say, my God, you know, uh, what are these guys? Is Biden really in charge? The answer to that is no. Right. So who's in charge? So it's, okay, so, it's the escalation great. thing. That Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, uh, going back to the original question about American diplomats often not being able to speak the language of the country, uh, there's a cancel culture going on against all things Russian in the United States and many countries in Western Europe, you know, Ukraine, where they're taking down statues and putting up other statues. Uh, but I would agree with Ray that the main problem is not the fact that American diplomats uh, can't speak the language. I think the problem is that we don't do diplomacy. I think that Russia and China have some of the best diplomats in the world. They really know what they're doing. They know how to negotiate. And compared to, uh, to them, uh, Antony Blinken is like a, uh, a child whose toy has been taken away. Uh, <laughs> we're, we're, we're like six levels below in the ability to even do diplomacy at all. Hey, Diane, well, go ahead. Eleanor Roosevelt actually made a proposal to address this, and I was really 
pleasantly surprised and, and surprised at the end of her book where she talks of her autobiography. She talks about her work at the United Nations and she talks about how difficult a time she had working with the Soviets, whom she considered very sneaky. And she said that um, that the United States had done a terrible job if we were upset about the spread of communism as she was. Uh, she said these nations, Russia, China, Soviet Union, then um, China go places, build infrastructure, learn the culture and become influential in that society. She proposed that in the United States that, and I may not have the exact years right, but I think it was at the age of 15, instead of, uh, or you could have a choice between mandatory military service or sort of a um, diplomatic service. So at the age of 15, American children would choose a country that they wanted to go to and work in. And for two years, they would work on learning the language, the culture, the religion, the history, everything about that nation. And then at the age of 18, they would spend two years in that country, working with that country for various advancements in the standard of living and so on. And I think what you would have seen as an enormous reservoir of goodwill, you would have had uh, tens of thousands of Americans who had firsthand knowledge of other languages of their nations. I think this kind of program would have totally changed our relationship to the rest of the world. And along these lines, I also would like to say as, as a candidate for office, uh, I, I don't want to say exactly that I'm offended by some of the questions that I'm asked, but maybe I should just say that because I think people have been very shrunk. They've been shrunken in what they ask for. If if you were to close your eyes and imagine an ideal world where every single person on the planet had clean drinking water, electricity, adequate nutrition, that in the United States, not only were there no potholes, but there was modern high-speed rail, uh, we had developed fusion energy. We had experiments in growing plants and curing diseases on the moon and Mars. If you think about what would be a life that's actually fit for human beings, then and then in your mind's eye, you keep that image of where we really should be, what the United States actually should look like. If you think about the fact we did defeat the British Empire, not so we could act like them, but so we could be <laughs> different. Um, and then you compare that image of where we ought to be to where we are. Perhaps the thing that should obsess the voters is how do we get from where we are, which is very backwards and small and suffering, really suffering. Why are there 100,000 drug overdose deaths in a year to be where we should be? And, and I think this is the um, challenge for all of us and, and for everyone we're talking to. And in a way, I guess I could say I shouldn't be offended because this image of where we ought to be has really been bludgeoned out of people. You're not supposed to have imagination. You're not supposed, if you if you even think that there should be no more starvation, you're accused of being some wide-eyed idealist who doesn't know what's really going on in the world. But I, I think we're really missing that. And we need more of that quality of intent. Optimism comes from intent. Uh, in the United States. And I know that wasn't part of the question, but I really had to say it. No, that's, that's, that's yeah, fine. Thank that's you. Okay. And um, uh, yeah, we're going to go to final thoughts now. And the order I want to do this in is I want to go Jeff, Ray, then Diane, and then that'll be for our live stream. And I'll add this in um, on the bottom of our post. But anyway, any concluding thoughts, Jeff, you first, Ray, and then. All right. Well, uh, my name is Jeff Young, and unlike Andy Barr, I will never vote to send weapons to Nazis. It's been my slogan all through the primary. 
my slogan today all through November. My website is Young for Kentucky, Y O U N G, the number four, K Y dot com. Check it out. Um, final thoughts our country is in big, big trouble economically, financially. You know, in terms of Wall Street collapsing, the value of the dollar about to collapse. Um, our military is, is uh, about to get defeated worldwide. Or um, the best case, it'll be, re e it'll be ejected from NATO and uh, we'll have all our troops back home, uh, back home from Africa. Uh, and we're about to get, we're about to sanction ourselves into another Great Depression by um, trying to harm the Russian people enough so that they overthrow their government. Totally unrealistic. It's, it's going to backfire very soon. Uh, we're on the verge of losing totally in Ukraine. And if we keep messing with China, we'll see a, a large portion of our fleet sunk, all out of ignorance. If we don't get some anti-imperialists and anti-war Democrats elected, there will be no voices of sanity in Washington. And uh, we'll just, drive off the cliff. So um, think hard about this election. Think, think hard if you wanna support Democrats who go visit Taiwan realizing that they could set off World War III. I don't think uh, any politician who, who goes to visit Taiwan, I think they should resign right now because it, it's so irresponsible so reckless and uh, could lead to such disastrous results for our entire country. Diane. Okay, thank you, Mr. Young. Uh, Ray, please go ahead. Uh, I would like to say that uh, uh, those of you who heard Scott Ritter talk about what is likely in Ukraine. Take that to heart and compare that with what 90% of Americans who are tuned into the major media are led to believe. There's gonna be a major shock, a major shock when it turns out that Americans realize that either they have been misled or that the Russians had done something dastardly to all of a sudden win, okay? Now, Scott and I agree that this is gonna be a gradual process in Ukraine. The Russians aren't gonna go bombing Kiev just because someone assassinated someone who was the daughter of someone people say was close to Putin, which was not right. But it's going to go slow. It's going to be a tough slog. And um, Russia will inevitably be able to go as far as Transnistria. And that would cut off Ukraine from the Black Sea. It would become a landlocked country. Okay. Now, that's a little dangerous because that will mean Ukraine will cease to exist as the country that it is now. But it's going to take a while. Now, what's the immediate concern? The immediate concern and doubly concerned uh, is the fact that uh, our, the Blinkens and Sullivans of this world don't seem to get it, okay? It's a concept that's really easy to understand. <laughs> the, the Soviets used to call it the world correlation of forces, okay? Uh, John Mearsheimer calls it balance of power 101. <laughs> It used to be like a triangle, the US, China, and Russia, sort of like, you know, equilateral triangle. And Kissinger and Nixon, as you know, played Russia and China off against each other 
which succeeded immensely in getting, getting good arms control measures and moving, moving Russia and China together against the US. Now, by virtue of the incompetence, arrogance, and hubris of people like Blinken and Sullivan, and people before them like Pompeo, my God, and, and John Bolton, and all these people that did such dire stuff for our country, by virtue of all that, Russia and China are the big, I mean, you remember geometry of what an isosceles triangle is? Well, these long sides are Russia and China. And this is the U.S. like uh, it's got the short end of the stick. Let's put it that way. OK, so that's the case now. And the notion that a two front war would be envisaged by people like Blinken and Sullivan is crazy. It shows they don't know anything about strategy, nothing about the world correlation of forces and nothing about what exists now in terms of this alliance between Russia and China. So what's the short term problem? The short term problem, in my view, is the U.S. intends to send warships through the Taiwan Strait. Jeff already mentioned that. OK, and Jeff mentioned Jeff mentioned that uh, China says, well, oh, that's territorial wars. That you shouldn't do that. Well, I fully expect, and the U.S. is on public record, the White House and the Pentagon saying, we intend to send those warships into the Taiwan Strait in the next couple of weeks. In the next couple of weeks. Now, what will the Chinese do? Now, this is the question. What will the Chinese do? Now, my Chinese specialist friends, I'm not a spine, I'm more of a Soviet than Russian specialist. They tell me China doesn't want a war. China is not ready for a war. China won't do anything. Well, those are the same people, many of them, who told me that China would never support Putin if he attacked Ukraine. And you know the answer to what happened. They did support, they did, in my view, they gave Putin a uh, uh, nihil opstat. Uh, nothing stands in the way of your going into Ukraine, despite our principal position on non-interference in the affairs of other countries. We'll waive you on that. We'll give you a waiver and we'll emphasize, as the Chinese do now, the merits of each particular situation. They have given Putin full support. Now, if the Chinese feel uh, like they would like to harass U.S. Trips, ships going through the Taiwan Strait, and there are all manner of ways they can do that, or worse still, if they decided to interdict, if they decided to say, no, you can't go through the Taiwan Strait, we're having exercises, or we're having exercises, they might last like a, a couple of months. Then the flag is up. What happens? What does the U.S. do? Well, Biden's not in charge. So who's in charge? Blinken? I mean, Sullivan? I mean, what are these guys going to do? That's what China has to deal with, okay? The Chinese may try to find out what the U.S. is going to do by provoking this kind of thing in the Taiwan Strait. doesn't mean war. It means the Chinese showing how much disapproval they make to what they consider to be U.S. interference in Chinese affairs. So here's the alliance, Russia and China. If there's trouble in the South China Sea or the Taiwan Strait, I can tell you, remember where you heard it first, there's going to be even bigger trouble in Europe because they are virtual allies. They will support each other. And nothing, nothing that Xi Jinping will do will be done alone without consulting beforehand with Putin just as Putin consulted beforehand with Xi Jinping on the 4th of February, a couple of weeks before he attacked Ukraine. So things are pretty labile, as the Germans say. They're pretty tentative. And uh, with the midterms coming up, uh, you have to crank that in, which the Russians and the Chinese are certainly doing. So where does that leave us? It leaves us in a very volatile situation. We have to educate our fellow Americans to what the real situation is and how Ukraine, Russia's entrance into Ukraine was not unprovoked. Russia's annexation of Crimea was not 
unprovoked. And if China does something in the Taiwan Strait, which I think, and I'm alone on this, is more, more probable than not, it will not be unprovoked, okay? And Americans need to understand that. Thanks very much. Go ahead. Beautiful. Thank you so much. And finally, Diane. Well, first of all, I uh, thank you. And, and I'd like to thank everyone who was on with me, Scott, who's not here, and Ray and Jeff. And we need to do more of this. I would like to clarify for everybody that Senator Chuck Schumer is actually up for re-election. He pretends he is not because he doesn't want to have to campaign or debate anyone, specifically myself. And <laughs> I think that we should force him to debate me. I think that would be delightful. Uh, we just saw recently that 100 members of the US Senate, that is all 100, voted unanimously in a sense of the Congress resolution, thankfully not binding so far, to declare Russia a state sponsor of terrorism. That is unbelievable. And they clearly have no clue the implications. And I don't believe all those senators could actually believe that. I mean, I don't know what happened to Saudi Arabia or perhaps even uh, the U.S. Pentagon um, on this, but it indicates the insanity of the institution or that you could have the senator from Mississippi, Roger Wicker, early on talking about we shouldn't rule out the use of nuclear weapons and we should rain destruction down on Russia. We have people who, if we were sane and we had sane and courageous leaders in the House and Senate, they would be censured or driven out of office for making irresponsible statements like that. I think that's why Jeff is saying. So um, I do want people to know my website is sareforsenate.com, S-A-R-E-F-O-R, senate.com. People should sign up. We have to break the blackout. All of us, all of us who were here were on the Ukrainian blacklist, which as Scott Ritter pointed out, is a kill list. And after the uh, events with um, Salman Rushdie and now this uh, death in Russia of uh, Dugina, um, you have to face that that is a real threat as well as an intent to silence our voices. And that cannot be allowed. There's far too much at stake. And finally, the last thing I would like to say is that in response to the idiocy coming from the UK, NATO, and uh, the United States, there is a new paradigm unfolding, uh, something LaRouche called for decades ago, but there is a new paradigm among these nations. And look, Russia and China have very different histories very different cultures and religions, but somehow they are working together and they're doing it in the interest of the good of mankind. And that is where we actually have to be going. And I think that it's possible, but only if the people in the Western nations, the so-called, you can't call them civilized Western nations, but the uncivilized Western nations <laughs> <laughs> come to their senses and begin to behave in a civilized fashion, which would start by forcing Chuck Schumer to debate me. Ray is... Oh, oh yeah, go ahead, Ray. Yeah, I just uh, wanted to make a, a slight uh, announcement, really. And it has to uh, do with keeping family, uh, family together. Uh, my son... Our youngest son runs my website. And if I appear on a program like this and neglect to mention a website, I am in trouble deep. So without further ado, our website is raymcgovern.com. Uh, my son always says, now when you say that, dad, always add, if you don't get it, you don't get it. But I'm too I'm too uh, modest to add that on. So if you just remember RayMcGovern.com, that should suffice. A pleasure to be on with all of you. Okay, so uh, I want to thank Mr. Jeff.
Mr. Ray McGovern and Mrs. Diane Sayre. Um, and uh, Ray, you can let your son know that the website